Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we are so delighted that you've welcomed us into your home. And we pray that you are having a blessed, happy Lent. Amen. Dying to yourself, living more for Jesus. I like to put it, more of Jesus, less of me. <laughs> That's the journey. So we would love to hear from you. So send us an email with a question or a comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. And today our guest again will be Tom Nash. He is a contributing apologist for Catholic Answers. And he's the author of a great little book called 20 Answers, The Rosary. And you could get this great little booklet available at EWTNRC.com. We had a great conversation with Tom. Yeah. You know, just opening it up. I mean, so many people, I think, in um, being Catholic, assume that every Catholic prays the rosary. But that's not true, true right? Um, there are a lot of Catholics. I remember when I went, was working at a Catholic church and I was doing the religious education, I assumed that all the children knew how to pray the rosary, and they didn't. And that's why their parents didn't know how to pray the rosary. That's why they didn't teach the children. So it was a real opportunity to educate yeah. and to say, this is why we're going to do this and yeah. in terms lead of your family in catechetical it. Catechetical teaching, our bishop at that time, Bishop Foley of fond memory, you know, gave a curriculum for schools right. and for the parishes. And one of them was like learning the rosary. Right. And so reintroducing the rosary. And, and I think that's what we're doing with the show with Tom Nash, who does it so well. Reintroducing, I mean, you may have been praying the rosary for many, many years, but there's always something new you can learn. And it really is communion and community with Jesus Christ and with his mother, with the angels and with the saints, and with the community that you might be praying it with. Well, what a great thing to have in the season of Lent. Lord, mm -hmm. teach me something new about the rosary. Or maybe you've never prayed the rosary before. Let me explore this. Let me see what this is all about. Let me look at these beautiful images, these mysteries, and, and be saying this prayer and look upon this. And, and to look with Mary, that, that was the John Paul II brought that to me and to so many when he wrote about the Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he taught me that it's not just me praying, but that it's praying, in a sense, through the eyes of Mary or with Mary, who bore him, who loved him, who was there at the cross with him, who praises and, and adores him like nobody else can. Imagine praying with mm -hmm. her. I'm really praying with her. And then to be open, as, as Tom said again, and again, be open with what the Lord wants to speak to you about this mystery in your own personal life. Yes. And what he wants to say to you. And so it's, it's, it's not just a mechanical thing at all. It really is a personal and living encounter. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's a way that God has set up for you to go away. Come away with me, my beloved. Come away with me, my beautiful one. And that is really what the rosary is about on the best days when, when you're seeking to do that. And not just saying, I got to get this in. I got to pray these prayers. I got to get this done. It's intimacy. It's, it's kissing mm -hmm. God back, Jesus back for his salvation. It's salvation on a string, right. meditating upon that, as Tom Nash says. And you might want to just start during this Lent and even just start doing 10, do a decade. Maybe be overwhelming to think I'm going to take on the whole rosary. Well, then start praying 10. It's a great, book, start great book for Catholics and non-Catholics alike. There's always questions about the rosary. 20 answers, the rosary. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. We're at home with Jim and Joy, and today our guest is Tom Nash. He's the contributing apologist with Catholic Answers. He's the author of a great little booklet called 20 Answers, The Rosary, and it's available right here at EWTNRC.com. Now, you might think the rosary, that's your grandmother's prayer, or that's what your grandparents prayed. No, it's for you today. And EWTN also, and we have the children praying the rosary, and they do the one where they're praying all over the world. How powerful that is. And I don't care how old you are or how young you are. When you see that, that really 
grabs your spirit and it because it's beautiful it's so pure it's holy and um, I love watching that when they yeah. air the children's rosary now Tom um, we had so much discussion on the last show but your favorite are the luminous mysteries and they have been introduced in 2002 by Pope John Paul why are they your favorite well, I have to say in particular, I mean, what well, you say, the whole life of Christ is our favorite, right? Because it's all about Jesus and his blessed mother. But I th always thought when I was a kid, I'm thinking, I'm in grade school, I'm thinking, why do we go from Jesus being found in the temple and then we go right to Holy Week? And I'm thinking, what about his public ministry? And of course, part of his public ministry is indeed his days leading through uh, his passion and death. But... I'm thinking, what about these other events? I mean, like you say, the wedding at Cana, mm -hmm. his baptism in the Jordan, proclamation of the kingdom, you know, his various encounters with people, sinners, healings, um, the transfiguration, meeting Moses and Elijah, uh, or, of course, the Last Supper, the institution of the Eucharist, which gets played out on the cross. I thought, why do we not have that? And so it just seemed like it was an incomplete. And where some people thought, oh, it's all set in stone, I thought, well, it just seems like we could round it out, if you will, because it's a devotion. It's not set in stone. It's not adding a fifth gospel, new revelation. Rather, it's taking existing realities in Christ's life and giving us something more to meditate on as five new mysteries. And so when Pope John Paul II did that, St. John Paul II, I thought, wow, wonderful. This is this is perfect. This is this completes the uh, the cycle, if you will. So we have it from his annunciation, his entrance into the world, with his relationship beginning with the Blessed Mother, saying, "Be it done unto me, under me according to thy word," then all the way to where it is done unto her word that is culminating in the her being crowned in heaven, all the way through, and then the luminous mysteries bridges that gap between the joyful and the sorrowful. Yeah. So I thought it was a beautiful, beautiful bridge. Mm -hmm. That's really well said. Yeah, the luminous mysteries, it, it's just, it's a lot of light. It's a flash. Mm -hmm. It's like every one of them is an epiphany. Some of the other mysteries are like you're walking through the way of the cross. You're there. It's very historic, yet it's, it's happening now. The luminous mysteries are like sudden bright light, real privilege. Look, open, see. I'm showing out. I'm showing myself. I'm revealing myself big time. Yeah. You know, the, the baptism. You know, this is my beloved son. The whole trinity's there. It's like, oh, my gosh, it's, there's just so much light. And the wedding at Cana, that, that, that miracle. The Lord, change the water into wine, and then, Lord, change the water into your blood. And, Lord, change my life. Do something supernatural within me. And I love it. It's very evangelistic, the proclamation of the kingdom. Lord, I, too, I want to proclaim with the EW10, with the media missionaries, day yeah. to day. I want to proclaim your gospel, and I want to believe. I can't convert anybody, but, Lord, you told me to proclaim it. Maybe you're going to convert somebody today, or you're going to show them light today that's never seen it, the transfiguration. You don't get any larger than the institution of the most holy mm. Eucharist. But all these things, wouldn't you say, Tom? I mean, it's just kind of like I'm laying it all out there. Suddenly you're seeing. I'm revealing. The, the mystery is yes. being revealed to the point, you know, we can understand. It's just big time. I'm showing out. I'm showing up. Yes. Christ makes himself public. As, as you mentioned, is beyond the baptism, but then at the wedding at Cana. And as you say, he says, not my hour yet to his mother, but he changes water into wine, which as you said, Jim, previews his changing water and wine into his body and blood so that we, he says, uh, he who eats my body and drinks my blood will live forever in the bread of life discourse, John 6. There it is as a preview and we see it. And, and Joy, you said so well at the beginning of the program about how less of me and more of Jesus. And I think of what, uh, St. Paul said in his letter to the Galatians, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives, no longer I, but Christ who lives within me. And not that we think of it in a Buddhist sense that we're annihilated, that we don't mm -hmm. exist anymore. We're absorbed in some pantheistic thing. No, but more like, like John the Baptist said, who was there at the baptism of Jesus, I must decrease, he must increase. So what we're talking about is becoming the saints we're called to be. And when we do that increasingly, becoming the saints we're called to be, then people can see Christ in us. And then how many times have you heard people say, hey, so-and-so is different because I see God active in their life. And so that we become magnets, contagious Catholics, as some mm -hmm. might say, to draw people, that we become gospels in a sense, 
blessed by God to draw people to him so that they can encounter more fully in the Eucharist and hopefully in full communion to receive the Eucharist body, blood, soul, and divinity. And as a prelude to meet us and then to be praying before they even become Catholic, full communion, to pray before the Blessed Sacrament as anybody, any pilgrim can do when they go to any Catholic church and particularly when they go down to uh, E.W. Chen. They can go mm -hmm. to that chapel. Even if you're not Catholic, you can draw close. Just as they did in the Old Covenant, you draw close to the... Uh, the Holy of Holies, so we can draw close to Christ. It's yeah. beautiful that we can draw close to him like that. Again, lots of questions about Our Lady regarding the rosary uh, from many within the Catholic Church as well as those outside of the church. And, and I think so many of the questions, just because they, people just simply don't know, why do you call her name when she's dead? You see, we, we know you Catholics, you know, do that kind of thing, that you, you conjure up the dead. These people are dead, and you keep mentioning their names. Is this really pleasing in the sight of God? Or you have this, the assumption, I mean, Mary's body is in heaven. How do we know Mary's body is in heaven? Where do you get that from? So take a few of those Marian questions. You're the 20 answers guy. What do you hear most yeah. frequently? How do we respond to these questions? Legitimate yeah. questions. Sure, and you mentioned the first one about conjuring up the dead. Well, where do people conjure the dead and what do they do to conjure the dead? It, that's like a seance, right? Or you get a medium where you're trying to get knowledge about something or someone. So you have a seance and you invoke a spirit. That's what, guess what? That's what King Saul did because, hey, God's not talking to me anymore, Samuel. And he's not talking to me through the prophecy. He's not talking to me a dream. So what does he do? He goes to the witch of Endor and one Samuel chapter 28, and, and Samuel admonishes him for doing that. That's what a seance is. That's what conjuring the dead is, to find out knowledge and also foolishly to think that you can tame these evil spirits. Fallen angels are power, more powerful than we are. To think we're going to tame them, silly. What, in contrast, is praying to the saints? Well, we know that the saints are in heaven because, for example, it speaks about in Hebrews 12, it speaks about the spirits of men, just men made perfect. Well, okay, we know that the prayer of a man, of a righteous man on earth, James 5, 16 says, availeth much as it says in the King James Version. What can we say about that? Well, how about somebody in heaven? Well, if a spirit has been made, of a just man has been made perfect, he's in a better position. But can he pray for us? Well, with God, he can. And we see in, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, it's not just speaking about in that chapter about angels, but about elders. Well, who are the elders but these holy assistants, men, who served God here on earth. They're, they're human persons who have died, spirits in heaven. And what do they have? They have the bowls of incense that represent the prayers of God so that they are able to intercede for us. So it's always in cooperation. What makes our prayers? We ask each other to pray. St. Paul says it in his letter to Timothy, pray for each other. Jesus is the one mediator, but please pray for each other, including the kings, because he wants us all to be saved. Yeah, pray for each other. It's all made efficacious, mm -hmm. worthwhile, effective, because Jesus is the one. Okay, so we got people, we got elders who can pray. Well, what about the Blessed Mother? Well, we know that, uh, for example, Elijah, he went to heaven. He was taken up in a whirlwind, and they didn't have his body left over. So what about Mary? Well, the Blessed Mother, all the testimony in the early church among the Orthodox and the Catholics says that there are no relics. Now, relics, what are relics? Well, we see like the handkerchiefs of St. Paul in uh, Acts 9, that when they touch people, it's like, is that, is that some kind of like uh, um, superstition? No, it's because it was associated with a holy person. Elijah and his mantle, what happened when Elijah's mantle, he's gone, but his mantle that covered him, Elisha, or Elisha, depending on how you pronounce it, he touched the Jordan River and crossed over. It's because of their association with the holy persons. Well, with the Blessed Mother, there aren't any relics. If, if there's going to be, if she's, if she's dead, there should be relics associated with her. There aren't. Instead, what we see in, in tradition is that, um, as St. Epiphanius affirms, that in his in his book, the the it's called the Panarian, along with other things from Syriac uh, testimony, that the Blessed Mother, like Elijah, was taken up. And interestingly, because people talk about worshiping Mary, in the same document, the Panarian, that he talks about the Blessed Mother being taken up, he condemns those who worshiped her. Mm -hmm. Those were the Coloridians. They thought she was God. And then we look at Revelation 12. 
And right before Revelation 12, we have we see the Ark of the Covenant. Well, what is Mary but the new Ark of the Covenant? Right after that, we see this woman clothed with the sun and with the stars on her head. Twelve. Twelve is what? Twelve the tribes of Israel. Twelve apostles. She's visibly there in heaven. And what is she doing? She's standing there. She gives birth to her son, Jesus. And then again, it says later in that chapter, chapter 12, verse 17, that the devil goes to make war on her children who are what? They keep the commandments of God and bear testimony to Jesus. That is, all of Jesus' disciples are her spiritual sons. And Joy, as I mentioned before, if you have your mother, you understand this perfectly, any mother is very much concerned about her children. How much more the mother of God is concerned for her spiritual children? And when we see this all come together, we see her as the greatest disciple, the disciple par excellence, precisely because she's the mother of God and has been exalted highly because she was yeah. so humble. Mm. I, think, I think more and more people it sounds terrible, are softening to Mary as a mother, even non-Catholics. Somehow, when we explain mm -hmm. that, that they're, they're getting that, Mary is first disciple, Mary is mother. Uh, but then, you know, the Catholics have to bump it up. You make her a queen. Like, I'm just getting used to her as mother, somebody says, now, now she's a queen. Like, where do you get she's the queen, that she's coronated? Yeah. Where do we get that, in the New Testament or the Old Testament? What are you talking about? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny people say that because in Jeremiah, it's a good point, Jim, because in, they'll say the queen of heaven, that was person was was a goddess and she was condemned and, and you, it was idol worship. Well, that's true. They talk about the queen of heaven who was Estarte or Estarte, who was the Mesopotamian goddess. We're talking about a queen mother. In the old covenant, you not only had a king, but you had a queen. Mm -hmm. Who is the queen? Not the wife of the queen, the king, but the queen mother, the mother because uh, sometimes, sadly, with polygamy, they had more than one queen wife. So what we see in, for example, in, in Jeremiah 13, verses 18, and it's it's a kind of a lamenting situation, but it talks about how the crown is falling off the queen mother's head. But it shows that there's this office called queen mother. Well, we go a little bit later, and we see in 1 Kings, we see Adonijah, he's trying to maneuver with his brother, um, Solomon. He said, I'm going to try to get Solomon's throne, because I know he's the heir apparent to our father, King David. So I'm going to ask Bathsheba if she would get Abishag the Shunammite, who was a um, helper of, a female helper of King David in his old age. He says, I want her to be my wife. Because he knew if he had her as his wife, then people would come to him and say, oh, he's kind of got David's blessing in some sense. Well, so he goes, he will not reject you. He will not deny you. Well, so she asked. She didn't realize he was up to no good. Now, the king always has last word, and the king uh, saw what he's trying to do. That is Solomon, and he said, no way. And in fact, Adonijah paid the heavy price of his life. But the point was, Adonijah saw that the queen mother had this role, this intercessory role. He tried to misuse it. What do we see in the new covenant? We only have one king, the king of kings, Jesus. We have one queen, mother. Why is she crowned? She's crowned with with all with with the, the 12 stars, the 12 apostles who fulfill the tribes. What is she then? She is our perfect intercessor. She's in perfect sync with the king of kings. She is the great inter intercessor. What did she say at, at the wedding of Cana? There we see her going on. Do whatever he tells you. When she says, you know, what, what is this concern of mine? It's, she's kind of drawing out his mother and drawing the people out. And she says, do whatever he tells you. So she, they listen to him. The water gets put in the, the big jugs. The water becomes wine. It's blessed. Hey, what are you keeping this good wine till the end? No, that just it's, it's the first uh, public miracle. So we see that the Blessed Mother is a great intercessor. We see in the early church that they continue to intercede for her. This was not an issue between the Orthodox and the Catholic throughout the first mm. 1,500 years. Even Martin Luther, even though he didn't believe in praying to Mary, he believed that she was the queen of heaven, believed wow. that she had images. But this is it. It's We, we need to pray for each other. Just like we pray for each mm -hmm. other in 1 Timothy yes. 2, we ask the Blessed Mother to intercede for us because we're not, God isn't done with us. We, we, it's a process, and we grow in holiness, not because we're great in and of ourselves, but because we need to grow in holiness, yeah. and that God can save us, yes, but God wants us to become less ourselves, as you said, uh, Joy, and become more like him, so we detach increasingly and become less ourselves and more God is what called to be. But you know, Tom, I think the world right now is in a crisis of femininity. We don't, mm. we, women 
don't know who they are <laughs> as women of God. And the, the world needs a mother. The world needs a holy woman of God, someone who's pure, someone who's holy. Um, and so to have and our someone mother. someone who's strong. And strong and who's, who's yeah. courageous, right? And so what a beautiful example that she is. But there are so many um, tools. There are so many pamphlets and, you know, for people to see, um, you know, the illustration images. of the rosary and all the images. So talk to our family about the need for images when they're praying yeah. the rosary. Yeah, those are great because whether you can have images, you, I mean, we see images on your set right now behind. We see the Blessed Mother with, with Jesus I can see behind you. Uh, but I would say, yeah, get images, which you might have paintings in a book. Uh, I know our friend uh, Dan Burke has one where you've got images. Uh, Dan Burke, who does such great work on spiritual direction, in addition to which you can get plenty of images online. Have those images as you go through each each um, set of the decades of the rose or each each group of mysteries. We can also have meditations that we're listening to while we're praying to help ourselves being focused. We can do this as individuals. We can do this as a group, but those are meditative aids. God's works through our senses. So we can have images that are still. We could have images from, my goodness, I like the International Rosary. I love it where you can see Jesus who's rising from the dead, from Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus dying um, on the cross, and his blessed mother's holding him in like the Pieta um, pose. Yeah. Now, these are wonderful things. That Those beautiful images are wonderful ways to help us center ourselves on our Lord and our Lady to help us encounter them more deeply and then to appropriate it more closely in our lives. Tom Nash, what a gift you've given uh, to the Pintos personally and to the church uh, as a whole and to those outside of the church. 20 Answers, the Rosary, Tom Nash. Go to EWTNRC.com. Get it now. Thank a you. wonderful gift for the season of Lent. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for having me. It's a wonderful blessing to be on EWTN. And Plenty. your program in particular. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Plenty more to come. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, what a great conversation with Tom. And, you know, I really want to encourage, and many parishes have this, they have guides to pray in the rosary. They not only include all the mysteries, but they include the prayers. Um, and EWTNRC.com certainly has plenty of guides, plenty of books, CDs, DVDs. I mean, everything that you could know to, to move and advance in praying the rosary. So there's no reason why you say, I don't know how to pray the rosary, nobody taught me. Teach yourself and do this beautiful prayer. And there's, there's so much more to learn for those of us that, that have prayed the rosary for years. And I think Tom really, in a sense, reintroduced us mm -hmm. to the various dimensions of the rosary um, to listen, the revelations that God wants to give us even beyond those images of salvation, the salvation story and the catechetical teaching, how God can break into your life. And it, it makes you, you know, we pray the rosary as we can. We need to take more time to pray it. And it's like, you don't want to gobble down a meal if you don't have, make time to feast upon this meal because it is contemplative, it is meditative, and it is happening. May God renew praying the rosary and especially with your children. Yes. Introduce them to the rosary. Get on the bike and just start pedaling. You know, maybe you won't do, you know, five, the whole five mysteries each day. Maybe it's a decade that you're going to pray, but you have the beads. They have their own personal rosary beads and you have the images, the pictures that you're looking at of, of God's saving grace to us in, in Jesus and, and with his blessed mother. And it'll just be amazing yes. what, what God can do. It's amazing. You get wet by stepping out into the rain. You don't get wet putting the umbrella up and staying underneath the roof. Get out. Mm -hmm. Praying the rosary is like going out into the rain, the rain of God. And from start to finish, it's about Jesus Christ, the King of King, kings and the Lord of lords. May this be 
the best Lenten season of your life. May God take every evil and turn it to a good, every curse and turn it into a blessing, death and turn it into life. May the victory of Christ be in your life and in all of your loved ones here and there. Keep it on EWTN. You're an important part of this family. You're never alone. You're always at home with Jim and with Joy. Bye now.